Our scripture for this morning comes out of the book of Revelation. We're going to be looking at uh, our uh, we're going to be looking at our last in our sermon series. It got put off by uh, uh, by our hurricane. Uh, Irene had something to say about what we did last week, uh, but this is going to be our last in our summer series. It's coming from chapter two of Revelation, uh, verses one through seven. And we're going to be looking at uh, first law in our series on first things. We're going to be looking at first law. Let's listen to what John wrote as he heard these words spoken to him. This is uh, Jesus speaking through John, and, and he's telling him to write these things down and write them to the uh, angels of the seven churches. And this, this he says to the angel of the church of Ephesus. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. I know that you cannot tolerate evildoers. You have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them to be false. I also know that you are enduring patiently and bearing up for the sake of my name, and that you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember them from what you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this is to your credit. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Let anyone who has an ear to listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches, to everyone who conquers, I will give permission to eat from the tree of life that is in the paradise of God. This is the word of God for the people. Thank you, God. As I said earlier, we're coming to a close in our summer series, um, our series on first things. Uh, this is a series that, that uh, a friend of mine, a very close friend of mine, who pastors at the First United Methodist Church in Morristown and I have been working together on uh, throughout the summer. Uh, we've been meeting on Wednesday mornings and kind of discussing where we are in the process and bouncing ideas off each other. And he takes some of mine and I take all of it, uh, some of it. And, and, we, uh, and we've been working together to, to put this together. And, and, and as we were talking about this now two Wednesdays ago, uh, when I thought I was going to preach this last Sunday, I, I said, going to say last Wednesday, but when we talked about this a couple Wednesdays ago, um, Steve had just been to a wedding, and the pastor, he said, had a really, really long sermon for a wedding, but other than that, he said, uh, that there was one thing that the pastor uh, said in his sermon that really struck him, and it was this, he said that, he, as soon as I find it, my, my piece of paper here, um, Yeah, this is really good. There it is. He said that the joy of love is in the discovery. The joy of love is in the discovery. Now, out of this very long sermon that the pastor apparently gave, this 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 popped into Steve's mind, and he said, "You know what? This would be great for what we're working on." And I agreed with him. It's a very short sentence, but what what a wonderful truth can be found in that. It it, it speaks to the truth that that any healthy and loving relationship is always exploring. It's always discovering new and exciting things about the other person in that relationship. It's always moving forward. Said another way, when you think that you know everything there is to know about the person with whom you're in this relationship with, and you stop looking for more, and you stop exploring, that's when the relationship moves into the possibilities of death and dying. As I uh, talk to my young couples uh, for pre-marriage, and I see at least one of them in here now, so hopefully they'll remember this. Uh, when, I, when I talk to, to my uh, young couples, I, I, I say to them that relationships are always changing. They never stay the same. They're either growing or they're dying. But they never stay the same. Change can be subtle, it can be hard to pick 
pick up, but change occurs in, in relationships. We never, as they say, step into the stream in the same place twice. The water is always flowing, it's always, always moving. When we lose the aspect of discovery, when we stop looking forward to new things and to find out more about one another, because we're always changing, that's when we can move into the stages of death in a relationship. An example of how we changed came home to me really clearly when I was deployed to, uh, to Iraq last summer. Um, I had the responsibility of giving the right finish briefs uh, every, every week, twice, actually twice a week. And what we would do in these right finish briefs is we would prepare the people to come back. We would prepare the people to come back home from their deployment to reintegrate with their families and, and with their friends. And how we would do that uh, is we would discuss what possibilities there would be uh, that, that would be different. And we would talk about that change. And how I explained it to him was that, again, people are always changing. We're always, we're always become different. Uh, but we often don't notice it. It's like having a, a, a puppy that you're not from a small, a small animal, a small dog. And, and as the years go by, the puppy grows. But you don't really notice it until you look at that picture about three years later of when you first got the dog. You go, oh my goodness, I had forgotten how small that puppy was. Well, when we're away from each other for a long period of time, Small changes in us that we don't notice can be magnified. So when I came back from being gone for only four or five months, um, the differences in me and Linda could pick up and the differences in Linda I could, I could pick up because we had changed. Unfortunately, when we live together uh, and, and we see each other all the time, we miss those nuances and we don't continue to try and discover one another and rediscover her. In today's text from the book of Revelation, John tells us uh, that, that, um, that he's in the Spirit. He's in the Spirit, and he, and he hears a loud voice behind him saying, uh, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches. When he turns around to see who is speaking, he sees, uh, the, the scripture tells us, he sees one like the Son of Man, uh, clothed in a long robe with a golden sash uh, across his chest. And we discover that indeed he is, he is speaking to Jesus. Jesus is speaking to John. The first church he is writing to is the church of Ephesus. And in that letter, he, he makes up, he, uh, in the letter that makes up the text that we just finished reading this morning, John is told to write some pretty amazing commendations about this church. Commending this church on, on what it has been doing, what, what wonderful things it has been about. He writes this to the church of Ephesus. I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance. I know you cannot tolerate evildoers. You have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them to be false. I also know that you are enduring patiently and bearing up for the sake of my name that you have not grown weary. All of these things are in the present tense. It appears that these are things that the church is still doing, still involved with. If we were to stop right there and not read anything else, we would think that this is a model church that we should emulate, a church that we should follow. But there's obviously more going on in the church here. Jesus goes on to tell the church, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Some other, uh, some other translations say you have lost your first love. So you have abandoned the love you had at first, you have lost your first love. And then he says something that I find extremely interesting. He says, remember then from what you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. And if they don't, Jesus is threatening to take away the lampstand. The lampstand that represents the church itself. In other words, Jesus is saying, if you do not do this, I'm going to close you down. I'm going to remove you from the body of Christ. You will no longer exist as a church. So if they are, as it appears, still toiling with patient endurance, not tolerating... <coughs> 
testing those who claim to speak in the name of God and, and, and finding those that are false and recognizing that. If they are enduring and, and bearing up for the sake of the name of Jesus without growing weary, then what are these works you did at first? What is it that the Spirit is saying to John, what Jesus is saying to John? Because the accusation against them is that they have abandoned the love that they had at first, I would say that what has happened is they are focused on the works and have completely forgotten about the love relationship with God through Christ. It is what we talked about in, in the beginning of this message. They have lost the love of discovering their partner in the relationship. A relationship that is always changing. A relationship that is ever growing. A relationship that, if neglected, will die. It appears that their love relationship with Jesus is dying, even though they are living a moral life. They're not cheating on Jesus or going after false gods. They are, they are not tolerating evil. They're not acting unjustly or without mercy. They are not growing weary and are enduring for the sake of the name of Jesus. They continually put themselves out and preach the gospel. But they have lost their love for God. Perhaps they're doing these things because they feel they have to. It's part of what it means to be a Christian. I have to do this stuff. Perhaps they're doing it out of habit. Perhaps they're doing them because it's just the right thing to do. Perhaps they're just going through the motions. For whatever reason they are doing them, Jesus seems to be saying, it's not enough. I want your love. I want your relationship. I want your heart. I want you, not just your works. It would be like if I, I brought flowers home to Linda, a beautiful bouquet of flowers, and, and she says to me, well, what's the occasion? And I say to her, well, I thought it was what I was supposed to do as your husband. I, I, I've got to bring you flowers every now and again. Ladies, is that so? Is that impactful? Or, or, or well, I found them in the dumpster behind this flower shop. And, you know, I thought, I don't know. I'll bring them home. Linda might like these. It didn't cost me anything. Actually, for Linda, that probably be the bigger ones, but anyhow. Um, it wouldn't mean much to Linda if I brought her flowers because I thought that's what I was supposed to do as a husband, that it was part of the marriage contract somehow, that it was in the rule book that, that we had, that this was what I, I had to do. But if I brought them to her and I said, Linda, I brought these because the beauty of these flowers remind me of the beauty of our love for one. relationship 
relationship with God is either dead or not. We can continue to go through the motions. We can attend church at least once in a while. We can write a check. We can do a job in the church. But where is the, the joy of discovery? Where is the passion? Where is the sharing and the adventure and the hope? So many people treat God simply as a cosmic vending machine. He's there to call on in, in emergencies and, and if we have a need. But once the need is dispensed out of that cosmic vending machine, then we're back to our separate lives, living in separate rooms of the house, if you will. And if we don't get what we want, then we become angry. But that is not the relationship that God desired for us when he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to make a way for us to be in relationship with God. The language Jesus used when he talked about that relationship was the language of abundant life. The language of fulfilled love. That is a life lived in full relationship with God. A life filled with exploring who this God is and why he loves us so much. As Steve and I were working on this article, Steve came across a, 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 uh, an online article that... that uh, and that's what I meant to say. We were on the sermon. Steve came across an online article uh, that was called 40 Evidences to Know That You've Left Your First Love. 40 Evidences to Know That You've Left Your First Love. You can look this up online. That's what I, what I did when you told me about it. And you can find it um, if you want to see the entire list. I'm going to share with you just a few of these, though. First evidence that I'm going to share with you is spending time in prayer is a burden. It's a duty rather than a delight. Your worship is formal, dry, lifeless, merely going through the motions. Private prayer and worship are almost non-existent, or they're cold and dry. You are more concerned about your physical health and well-being and comfort than about the well-being and the condition of your soul. You spend more time and effort on your physical appearance than on cultivating inner spiritual beauty to please Christ. Your heart toward Christ is cold and indifferent, not tender as it once was, not easily moved by the word of God or talk of spiritual things, and so on and so forth. Christianity is more of a checklist than a relationship with Christ. Your obedience and service are motivated and fueled by expectations of others or desire to impress others more than by a passion for Christ. Your service for Christ and other, others is motivated by a sense of duty or obligation. You find yourself becoming resentful over the hardships and demands of serving Christ and others. You are critical and harsh toward those who are doctrinally off base or living in sin, characterized by anger. You get the idea, that was only 11. There are 40 of these, if you'd like to look them up and, and to see, see what that looks like. Our bulletin cover this morning is from Paul's letter. He's writing to the, the same church, the Ephesians. Now, looking at when Revelation was written, when we believe Revelation was written, and looking at when we believe the book of the, the letter to the Ephesians was written, this is a much earlier time in the life of the Ephesian church. And Paul, as he typically did, prays for this church, and he prays a powerful prayer. Listen to his words from chapter 3 as Paul is praying for this same Ephesian church. For this reason I kneel before the Father, for whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have the power, together with all the Lord's people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. This entire prayer, but especially the, the last couple of phrases, is a prayer for a powerful relationship with Christ. 
It is a prayer asking that the Holy Spirit would have access into the deepest parts, that's not supposed to be up yet, deepest parts of the minds and hearts of this church. Listen again. And I pray that you may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And Paul seems to be running out of words. Uh, he's going to back up slide. That's not supposed to be up there. He, he's running out of words. He, he prays that, that they, would, they would be given the power, the ability to grasp the immensity of Christ's love. To know a love that surpasses knowledge. He's talking about something that goes way, way beyond, beyond mere religion, uh, religious formalities. Formal, established religion. Way beyond a, a, a perfunctory, occasional tipping of the hat to God. Just once in a while. Become, instead it becomes who we are of our very being, the fiber of our lives. What happened to the Ephesian church? After this prayer that, that, that was given, that we just read, and where they, where they became at, 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 as Christ is having John write to the angel of their church, what happened to them? Who, who, who really knows? But, but maybe the next generation grew up and, and forgot what their parents taught them. Or maybe they just got distracted by earthly stuff. I'd like to close today by praying that Ephesian prayer together and making it personal. Now, when I typed this up, I printed it from this computer, but I never looked at the piece of paper that came out the other end. So if anybody brought a magnifying glass with you, um, it, it, it's, it's in your bulletin. And you see the little insert, it's what, what look like designs, they're actually words. Um, I apologize for that. I saw that this morning and I, and I went, oh my gosh. I never looked at it and I told Katie that they were on the print, just cut them up and put them in the bulletin for me, never realizing what they actually look like. Uh, so I apologize for that. Hopefully many of you will be able to read them. Uh, if not, wait, if you can now go to the next slide. Um, it, it's also up on the board here, but what I want to do is, is I can read through that. Uh, one time at least to get a sense of the flow, uh, kind of personalize this prayer. Um, and and I, I'd like you to, to kind of internalize that because I want to pray together. Um, but it, it's been made personal for each of us as individuals as we read that together. So if you just read that over. And I'll read it to myself through one time and then we'll read it together. to grab 